Peace. I'm Kari Frazier, founder of Detroit is Different, and I am proud to deliver this video essay, A Debt Old, Not a Handout. It's the history of reparations to the city of Detroit, following three key prominent figures in this journey for justice for our people. It is the chairman, the honorable John Conyers, congressman, statesman, always a person bringing people together. Also, reparations Ray Jenkins. It is in the name. The man founded SLAP, slave labor, annuity play, and so much more leading into his work with Encobra. And when we talk about Encobra, we definitely are giving honor to my godmother and someone that was a board statesman herself, the Reverend Dr. Joanne Watson. This is a story you probably don't know in a video essay where you're gonna hear a little from them and so many people that play key, pivotal roles in their life. But more so, we're gonna piece together a little of this story about reparations in the city of Detroit and how they've always been intertwined because this is a black city and black issues and black justice is what we stand for. I wanna give a special thanks to the city of Detroit Reparations Task Force for making this possible and remember, it started as Black History Week, then became Black History Month, but you and I should live Black History every day. Because here at Detroit is different, that is what we do. It's about the creativity of Detroiters, bringing that together to add to the culture of this unique place. And it's always creating community. So when you see Detroit is different, I'm talking about the collard green cook-off. My Natural Hair Show, State of Black Detroit, and any of our collaborations, you already know where it's from, is from the people, because we do it where the people are at. And I'm talking about right on my front porch, and right next door is where we produce. So, watch, listen, learn, connect, share with a friend, and remember, Detroit is different. Peace. Nature is not interested in who or what we are emotionally. Nature is only, only concerned is to sustain itself. Period. You know what I'm saying? Period. Nature will create a plant that will heal, and nature will also can create a plant that will heal. You know what I'm saying? This is it, what? And I'm here for a purpose not to get what? It was dropped up. It's a build up. Visions of new beginnings and then the success is resilient. I've seen some and I've seen none. And experience and passive taking me on a past where I don't even imagine. It already happened. Snap fingers like magic. You'll see the action cause it's begun. Watch the rebirth as I speed up. And I move to the top of the place to be. Do it for the black steel, but I rap the street. Soul of a born in with the mind of king. Call me whatever, and I call what I see. I ain't seen much, so I re up. Building past the ceilings, boundaries that was given to keep me in a position. I don't get stuck, or I give up. Cuss and quit sucks. And I'm focusing on winning with thoughts that are listen. Change is consistent, takes up an instant. Dreams that's the big thing with the wisdom. And so the whole question of what what about the uh, cruelest, longest, mm -hmm. most punitive Holocaust of all time, the period of African enslavement uh, in this country? Black folks, African Americans built this country on our backs with our hands until they were raw and received so little credit and so little benefit. Other communities have received reparations. Why not us? Meeting him, you could tell that that was something that was like a fire burning inside him uh, to get us our due, to get us paid for that labor. If they talk to him for more than five to 10 minutes, the subject of reparations definitely came up. 1967, I uh, was asking for $1 million for each black person. Ray Jenkins uh, had a career as a realtor uh, in Detroit, very important figure. I remember the first time I met him uh, in the early 90s and I was producing talk radio in Detroit. And Ray was passionate uh, about um, the idea of African-Americans, uh, descendants of former slaves, 
um, receiving reparations. It was a passion of his, um, certainly uh, certainly toward uh, the, the end of his uh, adult life. I mean, we called him Reparations Ray. What was cool about that was it had a rhythm to it, right? Reparations Ray, a rhythm. Uh, Reparations Ray was serious as a heart attack. Ray Jenkins used to call my radio show, Wake Up Detroit. Wake Up Detroit. Every day, yeah. every day, one topic. Uh, Joanne, we need some reparations. It ain't a handout, it's a dead old. Yeah. Tell the people, Joanne. I said, you just told them, Ray. <laughs> so uh, after some years with him calling every day, I said, now, your name is now Reparations Ray. You're no longer just Ray Jenkins. Mm -hmm. But his name is down there for because people need to know there would be no H.R. 40 introduced reparations by right. Congressman John Connors right. if it had not been for reparations Ray Jenkins, who yeah. followed him all over Detroit, yeah. followed him around to every place he went to speak. Mm -hmm. Ray would jump up and grab the mic. Uh, Congressman, uh, you need to introduce that reparation. Now, the Japanese done got some money and an apology. And after five years mm -hmm. of World War II of imprisonment, but our people suffered 246 years. We built this country and never got paid. And we need reparations, Congressman. Yeah. And after uh, a number of uh, those kind of speeches, the Congressman said, you know, you're right, Ray. Mm -hmm. He introduced H.R. 40 in 1989. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And after the Congressman left, uh, re resigned from Congress, Sheila Jackson Lee picked it up from Texas. Mm -hmm. And this year, this yes. year, yes. it's been approved by the House of Representatives. Yes. So, but it got started here in Detroit. Detroit yes. It's Detroit. Mm -hmm. So we, we must honor reparations, Ray Jenkins. We uh, the money will come from the same source that they use the, uh, the bill of saving the loans out. They're going to pay uh, $161 billion to the bill of saving loans out. So why can't they use some money to, to, to give reparations to black people? So you don't have a problem with that it increases the deficit that we currently have? Yeah, let it increase, yeah. It's going to always increase. But uh, if they can find money for other sources, that they can always find money to give black people something for this injustice they suffered for all those number of years. What about black and white relations? Some black and white relations. They're just starting to make progress. Well, this uh, would be a step well, I don't think there's any progress been made anyway. It's the, the races has been separated, and by giving us reparations, it's not going to make the race any worse. Uh, the race is already paid already, so how could it get any worse? You don't uh, we think we've made any progress? No, I don't think it's made, made any progress whatsoever. Uh, Reparation Ray Jenkins, again, we have another Detroiter who was on the case for reparations before um, Incorporal was founded, but he's a grassroots kind of guy who was trying to get people to listen to this idea of reparations. Things changed when President Ronald Reagan gave one point two billion to Japanese Americans for their uh, being uh, in internment camps during World War II. And when the general public saw that it is possible to get reparations for wrong things done to a, a certain class of people, the whole thing flipped the script. They started thinking, oh, well, maybe this could be possible for black Americans. Uh, the day that that, that, uh, that bill was announced, USA Today came to my dad's home and interviewed him because they had just authored that bill not too long before that. So it, it, it took on a, a different ramification as soon as the, you gave credence to the Japanese Americans. Over the years since uh, I started mine in 1967, when I mentioned those uh, reparations uh, to, to black people and other people, they thought it was a joke. Yeah. People didn't take you seriously. <laughs> And so what happened in 1988? 1988, when uh, President Re uh, Reagan signed the bill to pay the Japanese, uh, then people said, well, maybe this, this uh, demand is not too ridiculous. And everybody started jumping on the bandwagon. And so, uh, you know, and it's taken off. Mm -hmm. uh, so we as we mentioned, of, we're getting a lot of support now. That bill is uh, calling for uh, Japanese Americans who were uh, incarcerated yeah, in, in the yeah, camps that's right. during World War II yeah, to receive twenty thousand dollars. Sure, apiece. they they stayed in concentra concentration camp for three years, and they go get twenty thousand dollars each. And black people stayed in slavery two hundred forty six years, then got a nickel. 
Well, Reparations Ray was always there. He was always finding extra stuff. Congressman, I think you should, I think we should include this. I think we should include that. And he would go to meetings for the congressman all through the city of Detroit and travel for him sometimes to get more people aboard for the congressman. Uh, Mr. Jenkins uh, was a stalwart of why we needed it. Um, something that he told me uh, back in the 1980s, he said this is personal for him and also his love for black people. He was a realtor uh, by trade, but he said that his father, because I think Mr., um, Mr. Jenkins was born in, I think, Mississippi, and he's Memphis, Memphis. Memphis. in Memphis. Okay. And he said that his father lived to be 103 years old. And for 99 years, he worked and toiled, uh, picked cotton. Uh, so, you know, our ancestors started working in the cotton fields early on. So that means his father started working at the age of four. And at the end of his life, at 103, he had nothing no wealth, no nothing to give to his family, um, to his you know upcoming generations. So Mr. Jenkins reflected on that frequently and he said that's why we need reparations and that means cash along with any programs that come along with it so that black Americans can have a foundation, a economic foundation which we consider generational wealth to stand on. My grandfather was a slave in Mississippi and uh and I, uh, I um, his, his daughter is right here right now, 89 years old, and she quite concerned about uh, the 40 acre mule that the black people did not receive. And uh, she's concerned and we are concerned. And, and uh, many horrible stories that I can really tell what happened to uh, my people personally. Uh, I've seen him as the, 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 the torch, the light that uh, never gave up on me made it uh, very clear that if anybody in any group, be it Native Americans, uh, the Japanese, all these other groups that had been uh, uh, given reparations, that African Americans should have uh, reparations. Uh, my dad was a real estate broker by trade. He uh, started as a salesman at a small company on the east side of Detroit. And he realized that he, he thought, I can do this, I can be, my own boss. So he <clears throat> started Ray Jenkins Realty, which was on West McNichols in Wisconsin. He uh, bought a standalone building and he became uh, a registered real estate broker and he sold many homes. When uh, that area was a majority Jewish uh, area and when white flight happened, my dad was right in the middle of it and he made uh, quite a quite a bit of money uh, selling homes to black people whereas uh, the white Jewish community was moving out and uh, and at the same token he was always a freedom fighter uh, and in any of his time uh, when he had time away from that job he was fighting for the rights of black Americans always the Queen Mother Joanne Watson of course She's the student of the, the provisional government of Republic New Africa. She's a student of um, Milton Henry and Richard Henry who would become Gaidi and Amari Obadeli. She's a student of them. And so she grows up as an activist, even in high school. And so she's already channeling that earlier movement and bringing it to her generation. So by the time she's out of school, she's an activist on many fronts. It's hard to believe that she's involved in so many different things, how one person could be in so many different movements. You know, y YWCA, NAACP, reparations, political leadership, campaigns, working with Rosa Parks, working with John Conyers, working with Coleman Young. It's hard to believe that one person could do all those things, but she was a whirlwind of energy and a whirlwind of activism. We need to put signs up honoring us because there are a lot of signs honoring enslavers. Yes, that's right. Like Woodward, yeah. Macomb, 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 John R., yeah. and enslaver. Yeah. Jefferson. Has just a time, a low down enslaver <laughs> who wrote All Men Are Created Equal, but have, <laughs> uh, no, he didn't believe that. He didn't believe that. They all, all thought he owned people, Africans mm -hmm. who were enslaved. So it's, 
uh, I think it's part of who you are. You ought to leave something better than you found it. Oh, for sure. So I wanted to leave some street names better uh, than they were when I arrived. Okay. And it, uh, and why not do it? And I had to, you know, you shouldn't have to argue and wrestle over that. Right. But it was that, do you know that some people, even after the signs got put up, had to uh, deal with some council people who followed that. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't, we just don't understand why. One of those who said he didn't understand why he's sitting in somebody's uh, incarceration right now. Uh huh. Uh huh. Don't don't mess with God. Mm. <laughs> don't mess with God. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Charles Pugh said he just he just don't know. <laughs> they never heard the child. He didn't never heard of Kwame Ada. Why is Harold McKinney's now? I said, listen, I if I fought to put it up there, that ought to be good enough for you. Right. Do some history. Right. Do some history. Do some history. Mm -hmm that we ought not to blame each other except for such sins as we are personally guilty of. Now, you are asking everybody in this room to feel a perpetual sense of guilt well, for, for, for certain things that were committed, uh, perhaps not even in this case, by their own great-great-grandparents. Oh, my uh, goodness. Now, Mr. Buckley, that's so unrealistic. I'm talking about a present sense of guilt. All right, uh, well, then, they then, must have a present consciousness of what they're doing presently to black people. All right. Now, and the well, fact then, is well, that they're benefiting. Well, then don't discuss slavery, then. They're benefiting from the from the uh, the institution that was created on the back of slavery. How do you know? Because it document because, that. All right. Let's take take uh, your your <laughs> slaver. He would take his ship, thirty five thousand dollars that he paid for. Are you reaching and, back uh, to the? You're reaching back into history. I thought you were talking about the existing situation. Uh, may I? May I? Where did your foundation come from? How are you going to uh, pick your financial foundation, your industrial foundation, which was built on my back? Uh, the Republic of New Africa uh, emerged out of the relationship, you know, so so to speak, between the uh, Obadelli brothers, or otherwise known as the Henry brothers, and their relationship to Malcolm X, who was a, a great influence. Uh, Amario Bedelli, uh, being uh, a founding member of the Republic of New Africa, uh, he took the mantle of reparations uh, from Queen Mother Moore, who insisted that it be included as part of the platform of Republic of New Africa, and they demanded $400 million and five states uh, in what is known as historic Black Belt South, the five states being uh, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Uh, I mean, we saw her. I mean, I, and I saw her as a, as as a mentor. You know, having the uh, initial connections to those organizations, people like uh, uh, Emilia Obadelli and uh, Chofwe Lumumba, and many other persons that were instrumental in co-founding. You know, the reparations uh, movement or in Cobra, and also the Republic of, of New Africa. So. You know, she, to me, laid that foundation, had <clears throat> been involved in many other uh, areas in the city that were uh, uh, supportive of the reparation movement. The Republic of New Africa was, uh, you know, getting reparation without having the land base that wouldn't mean much. So we wanted both. We wanted to, our 40 acres and our music. Oh yes, they were a, a, a force to be reckoned with. That's the best I can say when it came to reparations. Uh, Joanne uh, helped uh, organize uh, in Cobra uh, here in Detroit, the local chapter of in Cobra. Joanne Watson, civil rights activist to be sure, at one point the executive director of the Detroit uh, branch NAACP. But what's important to this conversation is she was also an early a member of NCOBRA, the national organization that uh, that has fought continually for reparations uh, for African American people. Uh, so passionate and so much so that when uh, Detroit voters uh, approved a reparation study process uh, a couple of years ago, um, she was named, Joanne Watson, was named to that task force. My friend and sister in the struggle, we were contemporaries. We worked actively in different organizations most of the time, but we worked for the same causes, uplifting our people. She was like tunnel vision dogged 
all right, on efforts to improve the quality of life for African Americans. And she was the leading council person for removing the question, have you been convicted of a felony? from applications for our employment with the city of Detroit and any business that wanted to contract with the city of Detroit. So she was about removing barriers. She was about recognizing that uh, Jim Crow was alive and well. And she worked tirelessly to push back, tear down, and rebuild. My, my, my. <laughs> Whenever she, whatever she took on, she did with her whole being, with her whole self, uh, with her whole um, energy. You know, there was no one phase of her life. She was a reverend. She was a, a, a doctor. She was an educator. Uh, she was a revolutionary. She was a Pan-African. Yes, she was, oh man, she was all of that and more. Mother Watson is, it, it was, I mean, it was just an awesome experience to work directly with uh, with uh, Mother Watson. I mean, she wore so many hats, okay? And uh, I, one of the things that I, you know, very dear to me is the fact that, you know, when she uh, uh, was elected uh, in the special election to city council, you know, she was very, you know, instrumental in, in a couple of legislations that were uh, uh, very helpful to the residents of the city of Detroit. An ordinance that would require prospective uh, 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 contractors with the city of Detroit to disclose that information was, was, was revolutionary. Major lawyers, Willie Gary, um, John, Johnny Cochran, and a number of other lawyers are now getting involved in trying to come up with a case to bring reparations and they're going to hit a number of areas. The federal government eventually is the is the big target, but corporations that still exist right now, and that existed at the time that these lawyers are beginning to discuss it, there are corporations that were involved in slavery. And a um, a, a, a lawyer named Deadria Farmer Pellman had begun lawsuits against a number of those companies to force them to divulge their uh, involvement in slavery. And so in Chicago, uh, Alderman, Alderwoman Dorothy Tillman will push forth an ordinance in Chicago that basically states that businesses doing, um, have any vending um, and, and contracts with the city of Chicago have to reveal their involvement in slavery. That would make them open now for the legal community that was getting involved in suing these companies um, and potentially going to sue them about reparations. But once they divulge, once that information comes out, now they can be targeted by people like Willie Gary, Johnny Cochran, DeAndre farmer Pellman, and other attorneys who were involved in this case, um, uh, Charles Ochiltree. They were the lead attorneys who were attempting to um, go after private corporations about their involvement in slavery. And so Dorothy Tillman does it in Chicago, and Councilwoman Joanne Watson does it here in the city of Detroit. But the congressman um, always has been about civil rights. And from his civil rights task force to voting, to all of his bills that were mainly, not just for African Americans, but for all people. Um, he just kept going because he just believed in what's right and what's right for African Americans and moving them forward to the next century so that all the bad things that had happened in the past would not continue to repeat itself. I think he was more so excited in the moment doing the work than like outcomes, right? My dad was never, I never saw my father get excited by outcomes. It was more so I have this idea and people are coming to the table uh, around this idea and we're building something around it. Like I, I, I can remember the glean in his eye when all these doctors and nurses came into his office for Medicare for All in 2003. I remember those things. I know we're talking about reparations, but I say all that to say that he was 
focused and committed to the work and the journey. And, and again, when we talk about a lot of the conversations we have today are about outcomes and the outcome is cool, but my father was very much so committed to the work and the day in and day out process of that. Well, the same way we broke the gridlock with the Martin Luther King bill that I introduced, uh, when uh, people would say, I'll join your bill, John, but I, I know you can't get it passed, but I'm gonna join it anyway. Uh, now, in the case of Dr. King, uh, I didn't have to make an argument for his greatness, his contribution, his brilliance, his courage, mm -hmm. his contribution to the nation and to the world and to his people. Now, here in reparations, it's a little, it's a little mm -hmm. further back. It's one step removed, at least. And so here the case has to be made. And, and it is true. You're right. This has to go through Congress mm -hmm. because it's going to be uh, legislation that will have some appropriation, some uh, a budget requirement attached to it. And therefore, we have to treat it like we did uh, civil rights legislation, the right to vote, and, and uh, everything else that mm -hmm. ultimately becomes law. If there was some way to get around it, I'd be, I'd be the first to... to uh, to do it. Congressman Carter has long been considered one of the progressive members of the Congressional Black Caucus, and the Congressional Black Caucus overwhelmingly was more progressive in comparison to the United States House of Representatives. Um, so um, him being a considered a radical within a group that would have been considered radical in the first place made this uh, a perfect fit. So he would be one of those um, congressmen who would listen to an idea about um, discuss, the discussion of reparations. Many Congress people would not have even entertained a discussion about some thought of um, demanding uh, reparations or even demanding the, the discussion of reparations by the federal government. My dad uh, gave John Kanye his first uh, fundraiser was in my home, my home in Russell Woods on Glendale Street. My dad had a, a fundraiser for John Kanye when he first ran for Congress. So, uh, of course, we know that John Kanye eventually won and their relationship blossomed. John Kanye was a seminal uh, individual uh, in this movement um, toward reparations. John Conyers is a Detroiter. Uh, he gets elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1964, start to serve in 1965. But what's important to this question is in 1989 and successive two-year sessions after that, John Conyers uh, routinely introduces um, legislation in the U.S. House of Representatives on Capitol Hill um, that address the reparations, reparations question. Um, uh, whether or not we should have a study group, whether or not that should be a process that's carried out. Um, there's no question uh, that John Conyers is an important figure uh, in this movement. Reparations are mentioned uh, from Kosovo uh, to Israel uh, to Alaska. Uh, it's, a, it's a common uh, diplomatic strategy that has been used from time immemorial in our mm -hmm. history. Now, it, it may require a little more unique application of the theory if there is a debt, if there is a seeking of an apology, if there is an offering of an apology, if there is a desire for atonement, then we may, we may create uh, out of this a different kind of reparations because there have been discussions now held, and I'm so proud that these discussions are now coming forward without any prompting out of uh, universities, out of think tanks, mm -hmm. out of, uh, of uh, uh, writers and creative people just being drawn to the subject matter. And what's happening now is that we now have a literature on African reparations for enslavement in America, how it would happen and why it would happen and who it would happen to. And this takes me out of the uh, difficult uh, 
initial task mm -hmm. of writing a reparations bill that, that people could say, well, I support this, or I want this one, or I want that one. We're so uh, beginning in our dialogue, so new in this discussion, that I don't want to give you the Conyers solution to reparations mm -hmm. uh, for America. What I do want to give you is the opportunity for us to have an official study and discussion of this for the first time in our history. Mm -hmm. And if we do that with uh, carefully appointed members of a commission who would not only do their own work, but would conduct hearings around the country for all Americans so mm -hmm. that this is not just an intelligentsia uh, resolution of the problem, but the people uh, with all views would be heard, then we would have the first official body of literature on this in the United States history. Part of the, you know, what was integral to the civil rights movement was integral to his work is coalition building. Right, we don't talk about it enough. I think we, a lot of times today, we focus. We're hyper fixated on individualism and how much I can do and make things happen and how much I can inspire. But part of part of the work is is, is making it so the work can do what it needs to do when you're not in the room, right? When when people are away from you. And so my father um, was really really big on coalition building, bringing people from various parts of the country, uh, various walks of life together to the table around one idea and getting input so that we can make this the broadest and best to reach the most people and impact the most people. We got together and I was tasked with interviewing some of the greatest minds in the country such as Queen Mother Audley Moore who was in her 80s late 80s, early 90s at that point in time, along with uh, Mrs. Rosa Parks, who worked for Congressman Conyers in the Detroit office. I worked in the Washington office. Um, and also uh, Raymond Jenkins, who became Reparations Ray, uh, along with uh, Professor Charles Ogletree, uh, economists such as uh, Dr. Julianne Malveau, um, Bob Johnson, who was the founder of BET Networks. We had corporate minds, we had academicians, uh, we had civil rights activists, Minister Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam, as well as um, Mrs. Coretta Scott King, the widow of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz, who's a native Detroiter, the, the uh, widow of Malcolm X, who had talked about reparations. And so from that, um, I, along with the staff, we synthesized information and started developing uh, the reparations uh, bill or language. So the first bill that we introduced in November, November 20th to be exact, uh, 1989, was H.R. 3745. And I remember so vividly, I'm going to take you to November 11th of 1989. Congressman Conyers was so serious, he wanted it to be introduced before the end of that congressional session. Both Betty Shabazz and Rosa Parks. Two very important figures um, who happen to be women. And as we, uh, as we um, recognize sometimes, uh, well, as we recognize as black men, um, that we always haven't been as inclusionary uh, with black women uh, consider that Betty Shabazz and, and uh, Rosa Parks were members of this community, strong members of this community and, and contributors to this community. Again, that just goes to the whole point of just how important, you know, and I'm biased, how important this town is in terms of leadership. For, for, for the country. Well, you have to think about 35 years ago when we initially drafted that legislation and uh, the, ten, the temperature in the country at that time. There are a lot of people who said it didn't go far enough. And so the minds that came together in the drafting was to, uh, to put together a commission 
to study how reparations could be dispersed to uh, descendants of enslaved people here in the United States. So again, we're talking 35 years ago, and it still has principally the same language that Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has continued to introduce the legislation uh, after Congressman Conyers uh, retired because she's on the House Judiciary Committee. An executive order would be mm -hmm. very helpful, mm -hmm. uh, and we've, we've gotten pretty close to that. I mean, uh, I was in the White House when the president uh, signed the uh, order uh, for the Tuskegee, the, the ignoble Tuskegee mm -hmm. experiment, and which he brought uh, all of those, there were sur some survivors and the family, mm -hmm. and there wasn't a dry eye in the White House. And I think in the beginning people just thought maybe he was foolish or something, but after a while, and they saw the in-depth uh, research that he did that he's done you know he made sure that he had the brightest the best of the brightest from young people to middle-aged people to older people working on his staff so that all the things that he thought about or even just said I'm thinking about this he can tell the light go over there and find me some information about this and they would always bring back exactly what he wanted and what he was thinking. And then he would tweak it to where he thought it would be representative of his people because he was for his people. I think the number one thing and the biggest takeaway from his life legacy and work is the importance of doing work and investing in work that you may not be around to see uh, come to fruition. Uh, there are two major things right now, maybe three, um, as we look at AI, right, I think about my father's legislation with Humphrey Hawkins full employment. Um, as, you know, AI automation comes and, and decreases the amount of jobs that humans can actually do. I look at reparations um, and, you know, we're still a ways out, I'm sure, but can, having people and, and planting that season for people to go do that work and then Medicare for all, right? Medicare for all is vital. Um, we are one of the sickest nations in the world while also being the wealthiest. And those two things, in theory, shouldn't go together, but they do. And so, again, planting that seed, having someone like a, a Bernie Sanders, a presidential candidate, uh, take that to uh, a, a larger platform. And with my father's blessing, I think that's that's a takeaway, right? Be invested in the work, not invested in the outcome, and uh, good things will happen. Every year, he was excited about introducing HR 40 in the House of Representatives because he says every year more and more people start getting involved and wanting to sign on to the bill. I think in the beginning people thought he it was a joke. Um, it's kind of like um, everybody deserves something except for African Americans, blacks. And we were the most enslaved people. I know that some people believe that they endured more than what we've done endured. And he didn't necessarily believe that. He thought that we were still um, encountering injustices and he just felt that we should there should be a commission to study the injustices that have happened to African Americans and what where we should go from there and what we should get. Um, the conversation that Ray Jenkins uh, and others were providing around reparations was a new concept. Detroit has played a very 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 you know, big role in reparations. In the conversation we're having about HR 40 right now, a lot of the bill has changed. This is not a, a handout, but a debt owed. And we're calling all Metro Detroit football moms to this year's event. I have a host of pro moms coming out to my mom's my first fan. We're having it April 21st. It's going to be on fire. I can't wait. And I know those who may come to the event, they're going to get information, resources, hear testimonies from these moms. I know I'll be there at Mary Grove. I don't know about you, but my son's not a pro in anything. But I would love to hear from these moms. I love to hear from them as well. So come out, have a great time with us. It's a great community event. We look forward to seeing you there. My mom's my first fan. Pro moms giving game to Detroit football moms. Providing resources to build character and class. Sunday, April 21st at Mary Grove Conservancy. Detroit is different. Visit Detroit, Teen Hype, and Team 84. Present this community event for Detroit's NFL Draft. Register online at Eventbrite.